Stop using five apps to manage your marketing. Meet Simplified One. It's an AI-powered all-in-one platform for creators and small businesses to design, make videos, and publish content to all social media platforms. Visit simplified.com and use Annika30 to save 30% today. Welcome to Your Brand Amplified, the podcast where we interview marketers, publicists, and brands to learn their stories, what makes them tick, and tips and tricks that make a difference. Welcome to Your Brand Amplified. I'm Annika Jackson, and I'm so thrilled to be here today with Jared Osborne. Now, Jared and I have, gosh, we met six, seven years ago when we both lived in Texas. Somehow we both ended up a few blocks away in California, and it's really fantastic to have reconnected and be working on some business together. So, Jared, thank you so much for being here. Thank you as well. Yeah, what irony. Yeah, yeah, right. We ended up being a few blocks <laughs> across the country from each other. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> so please tell us a little bit about your background and your journey to entrepreneurship. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I in my corporate world, I spent about eight to eight to ten years, sometimes I forget, in technology as a project manager, uh, working for Smaller startup companies, um, anywhere from or to, to big major corporations, right? Working for Hilton, Marriott, mm. uh, a lot of data management, data integration type projects, um, transitioning in firms, if you will, to the cloud, um, SaaS type software programs. Um, and so I've always played the middleman between the, uh, the client and then developer, mm-hmm. right? and what we're building. So, um, and then fast forward to kind of now, um, well, I'll actually take one step back. I was actually a big, big part of my life, which I can't, uh, forget to mention was I was a college athlete, played tennis in college from age six, all the way till age 20. Um, so that was a big part of who I was before, um, corporate life. Uh, but anyway, now, um, I've transitioned kind of that tennis mentality to Mm -hmm. starting things on my own, right. And being an entrepreneur and trying to figure out things for myself in this crazy business world. Um, A couple of years ago, I started what's called a search fund. And basically for those who don't know out there is just, you decide, Hey, I'm going to buy a business. I'm going to buy a small business Mm -hmm. and I'm going to take on a loan. Uh, perhaps to buy somebody's business, maybe they're retiring. Um, again, these aren't these businesses aren't like distressed businesses, but they're mm-hmm. businesses that you know have you know chugged along for the last fifteen, five, ten years, what have you. And the owner, for whatever reason, is just ready to go. And so I started the search fund as kind of one of my um, you know first uh, entrepreneur endeavors, mm-hmm. and then that transitioned over to which we can probably get into diversity capital group, which I run now. Yeah. So let's go back to, you talked about tennis and that was really important for you to bring up in bringing your tennis mentality to entrepreneurship. What does that mean to you? And what skills did you learn through sports that helped you transition into being an entrepreneur and understanding that mentality and and how to get things done? Yeah. So tennis, as we know, is it's an individual sport, Mm -hmm. right? Not a team sport. And so you definitely learn how to figure out things yourself. Um, and so I guess as we've kind of entered the corporate world and as we kind of grow in our business careers, I think there's a, there's a trend or a mantra that's always being stated, be a team player, right? right. <laughs> I didn't really know how to do um, mm. for a while. And maybe I still don't know how to do that, but uh, <laughs> um, I you can't be coached in tennis, right? So you have to figure out things on yourself throughout the entire match, whether it's two to three hours, mm-hmm. however long that match mm-hmm. lasts, you cannot take coaching from um, anyone, not a parent, not a coach, not anyone. And so you're just out there by yourself. Wow. Sometimes it can be lonely. And so I think that's transitioned well, right? Mm-hmm. And what I'm doing now, I wake up every day, every day is different as an entrepreneur. Um, am I going to work on marketing? Am I going to work on you know, business development, sales, my social media, my emails, what am I going to work out? I'm going to run a marketing campaign today. It's just finding that right strategy and kind of finding, you know, that groove within yourself to, to execute um, and, 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 and lean on your instincts to do so. 
And I think it's really interesting that you went from corporate world tech into deciding to buy businesses. And I don't know that many people who are listening would even know about that. We hear about private equity. We hear about VC funding, you know, venture capital funding, investing, um, mergers, acquisitions, but I don't know that this is, we haven't really explored this on the show. So what prompted you to want to get into that and how, what does that look like? Yeah. So what prompted me was I've, I tried to start a digital marketing agency like yourself Mm. and I failed miserably at it. And I also tried to, I also ran a, an event planning company with Mm. my cousin and those were kind of my two first entrepreneurial endeavors that didn't end well for me, I guess. I mean, I guess I learned a lot because of failure, but I wasn't successful. And I was like, man, this is just really, really hard, right? Owning mm-hmm. a business. I came from, you know, getting a paycheck every right. day or every <laughs> week. And so I said, you know, what, you know, what can be out there where I can buy revenue or buy something right. that's already out there and bringing in my kind of finance knowledge, what can I, can I use debt to do so? Hmm. And so the more I looked into this, um, the more, um, there's a couple books that the community, the SMB acquisition community will say that they read. Uh, one of them is the Harvard business book, How to Buy a Small Business. Um, and the other one is uh, Buy Versus Build, or Buy Then Build. And so I read the first one and I was like, this is it, right? This is it. And again, you are, and it's not to say that you're skipping the easy step of starting a business because (laughs) taking on a loan takes, you know, that can be heavy on your family and that can be heavy from a risk perspective. But SBA, Small Business Association, has a product out there where you can buy a business under 5 million and put 10% down. Wow. Right. You can't even do that with a house these days. Mm -mm. And so I can buy a $3 million, $5 million business only putting 10% down. um, Whereas if I'm going to buy a house, I can't even, I, they want 20% on a $500,000 house. Right. And so it just gives you a, a comparison of what the leverage is and the possibilities are with an SBA loan to buy a business. And this is happening. This is becoming a big trend over the last two, three years. Um, If anyone is involved in this Twitter community, it's, it's, it's become a craze. Right. And um, it's always been available at least for like at least 10, 15 years, but it's more so as you see corporate people getting tired of the corporate world, quote unquote, and wanting to go do their own thing. This is becoming a very popular Avenue to, um, entrepreneurship and it's called entre- entrepreneurship through acquisition is kind of the term that, that's coined. Yeah. So I think that's something that a lot of people listening need to know about that. We probably, you said it's becoming more of a trend. It's been around, but it's not something that people really think about. You always think you have to be the one to start something from scratch, right? Instead of looking at what else is out there that somebody else has already built and how can I capitalize on that? They have a built-in audience. They have revenue. So, I mean, I know there's there's still a lot that goes into it and it's not necessarily easier, but there are things that are already solidified that when you're starting out can be a lot harder to grasp and to get. Like getting, like you said you had two other businesses, getting your first client, getting your second client, making sure they're paying their bills on time. All of those things that we always have to worry about as entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that, like if, you know, if I'm telling friends or telling people I haven't talked to or anyone that I meet on the streets, what I do. And they're like, they're, they're many of the, many of their first question is well, why would they want to sell your business if it's doing so good? Hmm. But what they don't understand is that we have uh, the number gets tossed around, but I believe it's $70 trillion being transferred from baby boomer generation to the gen X gen hmm. Z. Mm-hmm. Right. So you have all these baby boomers who own all these small, small businesses who are this, that's their retirement. Right? right. They didn't have 401ks <laughs> for the last 10, 15 years. This is their retirement to exit. And so you have that really driving this trend. Um, 
and you know, you know, we, we, we're here hopefully to benefit from that. Yeah. So when you were looking at that model and that company, what happened? And then that, what brought you to decide to start diversity capital group? Yeah. So, yeah. And so I had to kind of the search fund and I was kind of going kind of just didn't really have a true execution plan. I would go on broker side. Um, I would kind of do some cold outreach, whether it's LinkedIn, email, cold calls to find business owners out there. Mm -hmm. Over the course of, let's say, the last two years during my search fund, I ran into, uh, I did end up finding a business to purchase. Um, we went all the way down to one week before closing, meaning um, I actually raised money um, from other investors to, to buy this business, as well as take on the SBA loan. So we had the investor money locked in. Mm -hmm. We had the SBA loan that was already approved. Um, we had spent five or six months on the deal in terms of due diligence, building relationships with the sellers. Um, and then one week before closing, they decided um, they wanted to they wanted to walk. Wow. And there was a few reasons that I won't get into, um, but there was a few reasons for that, uh, mostly on their end. And, um, you know, I, and that was one of my first stumbles in this, in this world. Right. And it, I had to, you know, I had to dish out, you know, quite a bit of money and due diligence fees, right. Mm -hmm. uh, attorney fees, me not understanding the process, not knowing the process, you know, I might've brought the attorney in too, too early, or I might've overpaid for the attorney. Right. Mm, okay. And so, you know, it, it, what they call sunken costs. Right. And so, you know, I experienced that and then I experienced another um, company that we were trying to acquire, which was a refrigeration company. There I was trying to act as an independent sponsor. Um, and that's a little bit different than a search fund and I don't want to get too technical, but basically instead of me putting up the capital or putting my name under the loan, what we'll do is I'll act as a sponsor and I'll put the deal together and I'll go raise the money from private equity or family office. Right. Mm -hmm. So I ended up raising the money for that. This was a $25 million deal. And um, the private equity company um, ended up taking my equity going into um, the closing of this transaction. Yikes. Um, and again, this was me being new and not understanding the process fully. I should have locked down our contract and our agreement before mm -hmm. we even got close to closing. Okay. Um, lesson learned. Um, but um, either way, still, you know, it was still a decent sized payout in terms of a, um, uh, as a finder's fee is what they mm -hmm. call, right? But I didn't have equity, right? As you know, as we all know in this game, it's about earning, it's having equity and assets is how okay. you build true wealth. And they robbed that part from me. And so I said, you know what? I'm never going to let that happen again. That's why I started Diversity Capital Group, uh, which is a true private equity fund. We have a full on board um, and we are doing things the right way. Um, we're much, me and my partner, Walter Thurman, um, we are, you know, we just have a formal structure, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we're, we're looking to execute there and, yes. and not get mm -hmm. uh, screwed along the way from any <laughs> other uh, parties that, that might be considered that Wall Street mentality, right? Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest lessons that we all learn as entrepreneurs. You know, you try things. I wouldn't say that you... you I know you said the word fail earlier. I wouldn't necessarily use that word because everything is helping you get better at the process and figure out what you need to put into place for the next time. And that happens a few times. And now you have a private equity firm. Right. I mean, with, you know, with a board and with everything else, and you're doing right. things in a different process where you know that you're protecting yourself. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so what kind of projects what kind of companies is Diversity Capital Group looking at? Yeah, I'd say there's, you know, we have a couple of different verticals. The first, you know, vertical would be what's called managed service providers. Hmm. Um, those are outsourced, think of uh, outsourced IT support, right? Mm -hmm. So um, maybe your brand amplified, right? Maybe you have 10 to 15 employees. 
Um, you don't necessarily, you're doing, your company is doing well. You don't necessarily have the budget to hire an IT person mm, to monitor mm-hmm. your systems, to monitor your infrastructure. Um, that's where MSPs come in, managed service providers. So um, in the world of technology, um, this can be many things, right? It could be managing cybersecurity. It could be managing data uh, infrastructure projects or whatever you might, whatever the case might be in terms of your software or hardware infrastructure within your organization. Um, so there's a big focus on that. Uh, and then we also have a vertical that's kind of open, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, agnostic, if you will, uh, industry agnostic. And so, you know, one thing that one term that Walter and I like to use is boring business that cash flow, right? <laughs> we're not, we're not talking about FTX. We're not talking about crypto we're not talking about the latest trend on uh tiktok we're just talking about hvac companies plumbing companies landscaping companies things that you and i uh pay for every day and that Mm -hmm. we know that are going to continue to be paid you know for the next 10 15 years and not get digitized uh or disrupted (laughs) by amazon in any form or fashion right Right. so boring business that cash flow my my um my board member hates when I use the word boring because uh, we joke about it all the time because he thinks that's kind of derogatory when you're talking to an owner, right? It's like, hey, I want to buy your boring business. But <laughs> I'm really saying like, you've done a great job in this niche. Right. Like, it's boring to others, but not to you and I. Yeah. We'll be right back. Are you ready to up-level your branding, marketing, and PR in 2023? Then join me for Brand Amplifier Live, a free half-day training on February 17th. Go to brandamplifierlive.com for more information. Yeah, I think that's something in like life and in business, because I think, I know I've been in places where I've been, ha- I've had to go out socially a lot for work and had to do all that stuff. And I've had times when I just get to enjoy being home with my family and those simple moments. So I would say it's not boring business, but it's th- those things that we know that we have to have are, are the, th- the things that we appreciate, right? The kinds of business that we appreciate, but also the kind of life that's like more simple and more at peace, if you will. So I, mm-hmm. I love that that's a vertical you're going after because these are things that are gonna be around forever and that yeah. people will always need these service providers. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the unfortunate thing is everyone else in this space is chasing those same companies. <laughs> oh, <no>. okay. <laughs> um, and so, you know, over the last two years, there's been a lot of competition that's come to the space where everybody's mm-hmm. finding out about, you know, how to raise money, how to buy a business, how to use SBA. And so there's a lot of buyers out. Well, the last six months, the buyers have definitely um, fallen off because of interest rates. Right. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to take on a loan at, you know, nine to ten percent now versus, you know, eight months ago you could get the same loan for at five and a half percent or five percent. And so um, you know, we're going through this this transition in time where multiples are coming down on these business that we're buying. So the valuations are coming down, mm-hmm. but also the buyers are uh stepping back too. Yeah. And so it's about finding out what your risk tolerance is and really making sure whatever company you want to buy that you know that we are in a, uh, you know, uh, where, you know, CNBC is talking about all the time, but we're going into a recession and a downturn. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So think about what kind of businesses are people going to need to continue having no matter what. And those are the businesses that are a little bit safer. So when you are putting together your board and even when you're picking a business partner, because a lot of people who are listening are small businesses, single owner, you know, solopreneurs, and it can be hard to find the right people to work with. So how did you and Walter decide to form a partnership? And then how, do you each have different things that you're in charge of? Like, how, how does that work? Yeah. Um, you know, there wasn't, you know, I wasn't seeking a partner, right? Mm-hmm. And it was just kind of happenstance. And it, 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 we, we built an organic, natural relationship. We both love the golf that we, we happened to meet on the golf course. Um, and so, you know, right there, we just built kind of a, a natural liking to that game, which transitioned over to business. Huh. Um, and so there was some similarities in what he was doing on his business side and which really meshed with what I was doing. Um, and so, 
um, you know, having a partner has been just amazingly, has been amazing just because there's, you know, we talk about going back to the tennis reference, right? Like <laughs> that, even though that I might have those skills to say, I can figure this out on my own. I don't always want to figure out on my own, right? I want to, I want to lean help. Uh, I need some help, right? I need some help doing finding deals or raising money or building the board, right? And so right. for us to be able to do that together has taken so much pressure and stress off building this organization um, and then building it right. And so nice. I'll just go back to say, you know, when you're trying to find a business partner or any partners at all, I mean, first look at your network, right? Mm -hmm. um, who do you know? And then, you know, second, just make sure it's natural and organic and not forced. Mm. And I think that's what's really helped uh, Walter and I. Nothing was forced. Uh, we didn't even know we were going to start a company. We just kept talking <laughs> and talking and talking. And then all of a sudden we have a company together. Wow. I don't even know how it <laughs> happened. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, I, th I think it's really important, though, for people to understand and think through these questions, right? Like what would you if you had a business partner, what would they bring to the table? What would you bring to the table? And how does that work? So the points that you're bringing up about letting it happen organically, making sure somebody is focused on the same mission that you're already kind of walking parallel paths and that it's very natural for you to combine forces rather than two people who, you know, might be friends, but they have very different ideas and they just probably should not be in business together. I mean, I've, I've had business partners in past businesses. I've been a solopreneur. Each one is a very different experience, but Again, I have to go back to like thinking the same things of what value do each bring to the table? Are you contributing? And is it a natural progression of the relationship and and working together? How do you how well do you work together? So all yeah. things that people need to think about as they're thinking through these issues. Now, so you have a diversity capital group, and then you also are still you have a, a foothold or a toehold in the tech world. You're talking about it a little bit, and that is called TechSu. Yeah, that's TechSue. And so the kind of the managed service uh, provider discussion that we had earlier mm -hmm. kind of rolls into this. Nice. Um, so if you, the easiest way to explain what TechSue does, we're cloud, we provide cloud technology solutions. So we're helping our small and medium sized businesses mm -hmm. transfer to the cloud or some type of digital transformation, wherever that might be, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's their collaboration tools that they use, Zoom, Microsoft Teams. Uh, whether it's their servers, maybe they're moving their servers off premise to a cloud, we can help with that. Um, and then also as it pertains to voice, telephone, um, uh, we're in that space as well. So the easiest way to explain this technology space, we're advisors. Mm -hmm. And so we're redistributors and re, uh, we resell major brands nice. um, at typically wholesale pricing. Mm. Okay. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely have to link all of your information in the show notes so people can find out about your tech stack, find out about Diversity Capital Group. Um, Jared, what yeah. continues to inspire and motivate you to go down? Because the road of entrepreneurship is not always easy, <laughs> as we, bo we both know, and you've shared some stories, but what continues, what, why do you want to continue this path? Uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, waking up on, let's say a Sunday, and having that anxiety of Monday coming, working mm -hmm. for the corporate world and mm -hmm. looking at your email inbox. That right there <laughs> is all I need. <laughs> I don't have to answer to anyone. Um, I do have a board, um, but we make decisions together. Um, but I don't have to look at my email and wonder, all right, am I on a time limit now as when, when I can respond to that? Mm -hmm. Or is somebody yeah. putting quotas on me or somebody monitoring my actions, right? That right there alone um, is, and I guess you can dial that down into one word, is, is just freedom, right? Paychecks aren't always great. Um, they're not always stable. Um, but the freedom that I have on a day-to-day -day is yeah. something that I can never, you know, I, I'll never trade anything for that, right? Yeah. And so we do obviously start businesses for money. But I think the most important reason why I started entrepreneurship is just to have freedom to do, you know, what I want to do and when I want to do it. Yeah. And have that flexibility with your family. I know I love being able to 
talking about tennis to, and you, you've heard me talk about this. I love being able to go in the afternoon and pick up my daughter uh, from school or go to her tennis match and be able to be there and be very present with her and yep. enjoy that time. And then maybe come back and get back on my laptop and work into the night after dinner, but that's okay because I get to choose. Yeah. And I think there's another, you know, there's obviously those driving forces too, which you and I have connected on in the past and are working on together um, is driving diversity and, and inclusion. That's another thing that motivates me every day, right? Yeah. And not seeing, um, you know, you know, minorities, whether it's women, whether it's uh, ethnicity minorities that are in the space of entrepreneurship, in the space of acquiring businesses, mm -hmm. in the space of owning businesses, right? To um, just one of our, our missions in Diversity Capital Group is to, to inspire others that they can do this, right? Um, didn't have a Harvard degree. They have rich parents. You know, it's something that we can all start. Um, and it's not all about knowledge, right? It's about connecting with the right people, having a mission and staying focused. Um, so that drives me every day as well. Wow. Yeah, that's really beautiful. So where do you see diversity capital going in the next three to five years? Yeah, so I think, you know, to continue to, you know, we haven't had our first acquisition yet. We're in the, we're under LOI right now on a current um, company that we hope to, to close soon. Um, so really locking in that first business. Um, and then um, we want to do a roll up, right? So mm -hmm. uh, those, those who are not familiar with that term, it's basically if whatever company we want to buy, we want to buy the like company. So if we buy a managed service provider, we buy mm -hmm. a digital marketing agency, we want to buy multiple companies and kind of grow through acquisition. Mm -hmm. There's going to be also organic ways to grow within those companies that we purchase. Um, you know, whether it's little revenue, different revenue streams that we can create or that we can take advantage of. But one of the main reasons that we got into this game is that you can grow so fast through acquisition, right? Overnight. Yeah, you might be taking on leverage your debt, but you can grow 50%, 80% overnight. And so that's the beauty of acquisition. Um, again, comes with a lot of risks and headaches. But, um, you know, in five years, we want to, you know, we want to see, you know, at least five to 10 companies that are under our roof. And, um, you know, on, on top of that, you know, we want to see other minority um, uh, owners within our platform mm -hmm. taking advantage of that equity. And wow. then we want other minorities that are investors where we welcome all investors, by the way, um, <laughs> but we want to see those minority investors, more specifically these athletes. Uh, my partner played in the NFL, uh, Walter. And so one of the big things that we all talk about is, you know, maintaining wealth for these right. athletes, right? After three years, 80% of them go into financial hardship. Oh, wow. We would love to be able to change that for them, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and be the avenue for them to preserve and grow their wealth. Nice. Yeah, it's it's a big issue all over just the fact that we're not raised with many of us, I shouldn't generalize, but most of us are not raised with financial education and really understanding the power of leveraging debt of you know, good debt, bad debt, all of the different things and then also making our money work for us and these NFL guys with big paychecks often spend on flashy things because they're not getting the right advice. So if they can invest in things that are going to grow their portfolio, grow, grow their income when they're retired, because the NFL career is what average is like six years, three years, three. Oh, three it's years. three years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and I think it's just helping them to not only, you know, move their money in, in, in ways that they can preserve, but also getting them in that mindset, right. Of there's, um, and, and Walter can speak best, um, best on this too. I think you're going to interview him at some point. Um, change having that mentality, life after NFL, right? Mm -hmm. Preparing the mind for that before you retire, not when you retire. Because if you're preparing when you retire, it's too late. Too late. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So. Wow. Well, what else would you like to share with our audience today? Is there any other advice that you'd give to the aspiring entrepreneur or somebody who's interested in? following in your footsteps and learning how to acquire businesses in this way? 
Yeah, sure. Um, you know, one of the things that I did was I think people ask me all the time, how did I get started? You know, how are you knowledgeable on the subject? And the, really the thing that I did was I, I, I saw listings, right? So just like you would see mm -hmm. listings on realtor.com, if you were mm -hmm. run a house, I would go to the broker website and I'd call every broker and hop on the phone with them. Right. And I think speaking to them, you know, you know, expedited that learning curve. Mm -hmm. And just understanding how to frame, you know, you, yourself as a buyer, but also how to understand the financial picture of a business, how to understand the marketing picture of the business, the employees that make up that business, you know, really the key things to look at when you're searching for these businesses. Um, so just pick up the phone and call them. Um, and then, you know, also you could sign up, you know, you, what you have to do is sign an NDA so you, they can give you um the information about that business, they'll send you a PDF called a STEM. And, you know, you could get a, you can get an understanding of what that business likes and, you know, in like a 15, 20 page PDF. Um, and, you know, in reading, I, I'm a big reader, but at the same time, I think taking action over reading is better than reading. Hmm. Um, sometimes I've been caught up just reading books all day long and I don't execute. <laughs> So yeah, I felt smart, but I wasn't doing getting anything done. And so that's when I just said, you know what, I need to pick up the phone and start calling people. And that really expedited my learning curve. So now when I look at a business, I can literally, you know, give me five minutes and I'm pretty much good. Nice. You know, I could say yeah, yay or nay. Um, wow. As before, time is your most, you know, time is your most important factor here. And if you're wasting time looking at 10 businesses, um, you know, that could take, you know, they, that's just taking up too much time and, and brain power, right? So the quicker you are to say yes or no to a business, is it going to fit your mentality? Is it, can you really picture yourself um, running this business? Can you picture yourself? Um, is this business have any risks associated, whether it's a macro risk or whether it's risk associated with internally, mm -hmm. right? And just being able to pick that up on, you know, a phone call or a quick review of the sim, I think is very important. Hmm. Nice. Well, I mentioned earlier, we're going to put your information in the show notes so that people can find out more about Diversity Capital and TechSue and hopefully use your services, consult. I'm really excited about the future and seeing what you all do next and being part of it, hopefully. Um, is there anything that you live by? A quote, a mantra, a motto? Uh, yeah, so I do. Um, God is good. And we're sometimes we get caught up in this selfish um, nature of what we want to do or mm -hmm. where we think we want to go. Mm -hmm. If I could just get that car, if I could just get that business, right? But sometimes God has another plan for you. So let God lead you um, in a way to um, for you to make an impact on this world. Mm, that's beautiful. Jared, thank you so much. I enjoyed our conversation. It's always great to see you, even over Zoom. <laughs> And yeah. I am super thrilled. I think you've given some interesting things for our audience to think about and how to approach business and looking at businesses and the fact that you don't have to just start from scratch, although you you had to obviously create the fund and the private equity firm to buy these businesses, but there's a lot of different ways. But you to don't need in. to do that. Yeah, you don't have to do that. So, and uh, take advantage of Small Business Association too. It's wealth of resources, money resources, tools to get better at your business. And that is what we're all pushing for as we're in this recession and as we're going into the new year. So thank you to our audience for coming for another episode of Your Brand Amplified. And I'll be back again in a few more days with another amazing expert speaker. Want more? Check out amplifywithannica.com or follow me on socials at Amplify with Annika. Editing long podcasts like this or webinars for social is time-consuming. Simplified AI Clips uses AI to turn your lengthy videos into short, viral clips. Create shareable content from your recordings in a few minutes. Built for small businesses and marketers looking to save time and boost engagement, visit simplified.com and use Annika30 to save 30% today.